This video is sponsored by Dollar Shave Club, who are now offering $5 starter kits if you visit dollarshaveclub.com slash superbunnyhop. Thank you, Dollar Shave Club, and let's get on with the show. This is a simulation of a simulation of mundanity. A surreal disquiet plagues the images of these people who are neither happy nor sad, trapped in their questionable reality. Is it a mockery of humanity or all fun and games to play The Sims forever? <coughs> Sorry about that. When I was a kid, my grandfather was really into model trains. He had converted an entire room of the basement into a mountain pass with a little mid-century nostalgic American red brick town that intersected with tunnels going through mountains that extended 20, 30 inches into the air. It seemed like the trains were more of a gateway for getting into hobby miniaturing in general. A lot more of the world's plastic was being devoted to roads and canals and overpasses, trees and hills and buildings than for the trains themselves. It was ostensibly a train set, but really, he was making his own little world in that room. Real shame that the next generation got addicted to TV. According to Will Wright's notes when developing The Sims, what my grandfather was doing was similar to what Will Wright was doing when developing Sim City, a radically open-ended game for the 80s that allowed players to focus on the particulars or the alternate ways to game its systems. He desired for more computer toys, seeing them as an evolution of what he called play technology. The next step up from the train set was to make a computer toy out of a dollhouse, reversing the traditional genders that this kind of product would appeal to in order to appeal to... all genders. The Sims was originally planned to be called Dollhouse, based on which model toy he would be gamifying this time. But The Sims turned into more than a digital house. After players build their house, they drop virtual people into it, and the dynamics of that live mode quantify the abstract stressors of real life into simple math for the sake of gameplay. The Sims gamifies life itself. When it was released in 2000s, The Sims was an unexpected hit. It broke the violent, shooter-dominated trends of the market and crossed a very real gender gap that typically saw computer games as being marketed towards boys. But as the years rolled on, The Sims came to appeal to everybody across the world. Boys and girls, kids and adults. It was released in 14 different languages, selling so many products across so many sequels, spin-offs, expansions and add-ons that it's now among the most popular gaming franchises of all time, occasionally finding itself within reach of Nintendo's throne. It's a thoroughly milked cash cow nowadays, but back in 2000, The Sims was weird, it was artsy, it was avant-garde, and in retrospect, the success that it would later come to have makes a lot of sense. Players can self-insert themselves in countless ways, and play with a universally recognizable setting in countless ways. The aesthetics of a generic American TV culture spoken in gibberish were intended to make The Sims' world globally recognizable, and the relative utopia of The Sims' economy, where everyone starts adulthood with $20,000 to spare on fantastically underinflated construction costs supported by an abundant job market with no higher education requirements? That makes personal, intimate, realistic self-insert wish fulfillment and power fantasies easily within reach as well as being outlets for experimentation, creativity, humor, frustration, and even sadism. In the evolving conversation about the ideological and political influences behind game design, I've always found it fishy that sim games and city builders are not pointed at as suspect number one. These are game designs where the gameplay itself is in manipulating society on a large scale, and there's obviously some kind of idealism behind the utopia the sims live in. Unfortunately, Will Wright and much of the original team behind the original game are elusive these days and unresponsive for interview questions, but even if they weren't, they would just be repeating themselves. Because the behind-the-scenes processes behind the inspirations and the making of The Sims is very well documented. So well documented, in fact, that the original game's manual has a reading list of the source material they use. So, <laughs> let's do this. Here's a bunch of highly generalized summaries of some of them based on really quick skim-throughs and reviews. Home, a short history of an idea, is a history of home architecture that stretches from the Middle Ages to the 1980s when the book was written. It's broken up into chapters titled after abstract concepts like intimacy and privacy, light and air, or simply ease. 
The author gradually follows the development of someone's home becoming their source of comfort, noting how and why people did not use that word to describe their homes up until the 18th century. Before then, European-influenced homes, for the most of us out there, would have been cramped and crowded. People did not value privacy and comfort in their homes in the way that The Sims does today. Christopher Alexander is specially thanked in the credits for the deluxe version of The Sims, and he's also frequently cited in interviews as well. This book is about design. In his case, it's architectural design, but these concepts can be applied to plenty of other fields too. Notes on the synthesis of form has got a lot of high-minded conceptual thinking on how to decipher the logic behind what counts as design and what doesn't. He theorizes that the deliberate ordering and arrangement of otherwise natural materials forms a fundamental unit of design, the pattern. Alexander compares the patterns and sounds and symbols that make up languages with the unconscious assumptions architects bring to their building projects. Events, thoughts, and problems that repeat themselves can also count as patterns too, and he gradually works his way up to describing the theories behind attractive pattern making that can go into everything from attractive city layouts to floor plans to doorknobs. And there is a lot of personal idealism to it. Alexander's an accomplished architect, and he doesn't just write down how to do architecture correctly, but also what he thinks is wrong with contemporary designs. In this way, The Sims can be seen as both an implementation and a test of Alexander's architectural principles. In an interview with Jeff Keighley shortly before the launch of The Sims, he summed it up by saying, Alexander's rules were those common sense ones most architects don't think twice about. Don't make a balcony more than six feet deep or it won't get used much. And if a roof appears to be supported only by spindly posts, it'll make people nervous. Time for Life is a 1997 study that detailed a bunch of people who kept time diaries throughout the day, detailing what they did and with whom. Among the discoveries made was that in the 90s, Americans did have about an hour more free time than in the 60s, but that there was greater pressure to define themselves by how much time they spent at work. They also discovered that the gender gap for domestic chores being done by women was closing in on the 90s and that men and women were sharing more time for both housework and child rearing. The activities reported included items like meal prep, cleaning up, repairs, reading, and shopping, likely influencing the general animation lengths for The Sims' activities and how that would scale against the total amount of time the player has on the in-game clock as well as the uh, gender-neutral approach to The Sims' lifestyles and the decision to make shopping happen while the player pauses time. If you added daily shopping trips to the equation, then players would probably not have enough time to do the more fun stuff. In that Keeley interview, Will Wright also said, I don't think people realize how much tactical and strategic forethought goes into their daily lives. There's a whole subconscious time efficiency layer in our lives. In essence, real-time strategy is our lives. Hidden order, the economics of everyday life, bills itself as, and I quote, an essential guide for modern living. It's for, and I quote, just about anyone who wants a clear-cut approach to why we make the choices we do and a sensible strategy for how to make the right ones. It's kind of a proto-freakonomics, presenting this school of thought that economics is not just about determining the value of money and goods, but it's also about measuring the value of choices. So, the author goes over the basics of economics and game theory and how they can apply to a bunch of everyday decisions, from love and happiness to crime, but there's actually a good chunk of criticism directed at this book, alleging that a lot of accepted behaviors we do are not the rational result of economic math, which actually makes it easier to imagine Will Wright flipping through this thing to come up with ways to deconstruct everyday decisions into gameplay math. But when scrolling through the multitude of interviews and insider essays and biographical pieces and other behind-the-scenes materials published for The Sims, it becomes apparent that there's a more anecdotal, qualitative, play-tested experience that informed its design philosophy. And, after all, we all have to see life through our own particular frame of reference, informed by our own experiences. And few experiences are as life-changing as a house fire. Over two years after SimCity released, Will Wright's home burned down in the deadly 1991 Oakland firestorm. Their escape from the disaster was dangerous and dramatic. He drove through what he describes as a corridor of flames, with a car full of family and neighbors returning to see chimney shafts and melted vehicles left behind. 
Though recently releasing a massively successful computer game probably helped, Will Wright noticed that he wasn't as bothered by the loss of his material possessions as he expected. What was infinitely more valuable were the human lives inside, and the intimate connection he shared with them. The fact that we got out of there and none of our family was hurt seemed so much more important. Facing that realization, and then juggling how much he valued the new purchases he made when rebuilding their lives, was the genesis of The Sims. I started assessing my material needs. A toothbrush, underwear, a car, a house. I was surprised how I didn't miss stuff. I started to wonder about all the things we have and how we purchased them for a reason. Why do we need X or Y or Z? Why do we think something will make me happier? It almost came down to Maslow's Pyramid of Needs, he says. And on Maslow's Pyramid of Needs, you can almost spot the same checklist of the most basic gameplay challenges that meters a sim's well-being. Food, water, sleep, shelter, social belonging. Further up is self-esteem. Sims won't want to work on self-improvement or on the professional skills or exercises or charisma that allows the player to unlock new activities and jobs unless they've already satisfied a bunch of lower needs first, which are represented by more close-ended, simpler gameplay goals. And if you're in need for a self-esteem boost because your hygiene meter's not all the way maxed out, then consider signing up for the $5 shave, shower, or oral kits from dollarshaveclub.com. Pre-shave prep scrub? I didn't even know this was a thing, but it turns out this was the missing link in my routine preventing the little red skin irritation bumps I used to get under my beard line, so go figure. Hell yeah, dollarshaveclub.com slash superbunnyhop. Anyways, the higher levels of Maslow's pyramid, the self-actualization stuff, is what the player's in charge of. This is the player expressing themselves creatively, achieving self-motivated goals, and gaming the game's open-ended systems into something unexpected or clever that has you thinking up your own exciting story for it along the way. That's the hook of so many great simulation strategy games, how they stimulate the playfulness of your imagination. And that's the design philosophy that you see outlined over so many of Will Wright's old notebook pages. Entertainment value is subjective, and it can be argued that what you're really buying into when you purchase a video game is not necessarily tied to the quality of the software itself or the realism of its simulation. It's the enjoyment that goes through your head when you engage with those things. This argument is outlined by Dan Hopkins, a programmer on The Sims who argued that the game aspect of a town builder or Sims game is separate from the simulation aspect. A fire is only a disaster in the sense that it's assuming the player isn't playing the role of a pyromaniac. Or, for a more optimistic reason, players can deliberately spark fires to set up a disaster recovery scenario. They intend to win by recovering and rebuilding from the damage. For The Sims 4, a community has propped up of player-made challenges, aiming to make things interesting with self-imposed goals. And I picked the Rags to Riches Challenge, in which you make things a little less utopian by cheating the game to clean out your Sims' bank account to work your way up from homelessness. Connecting the simulation aspect of this game directly into the player's own life is, in my case, an inescapably compelling hook. And that's hooked about 200 million of us. The Sims is intimate. It is personal. It can be a journey of self-discovery, and in my head it gets creepy and turns into a Rorsark blob. Rorschach. 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 The design of this genre has a lot to do with playing into the player's own specific frame of reference, thanks to just how recognizable its suburban domestic setting and its virtualized lives are. These games are designed to support multiple interpretations, metagames, toys, and tools, all coming from the one activity of playing The Sims. Not unlike building a model train set that becomes a model town that became, in the head of my grandfather, a kind of model society full of imaginary little model lives. What haunts me 
is that in all the faces of all the sims, I see no sympathy, no consciousness, no soul. Only the inanimate automation of a machine following its own instruction. But who made this machine? What was their philosophy, the divine plan and the vision behind its creation? And why? These are the questions that make this truly an electronic art.